Good morning. Good morning. Welcome to St. John Hill Church. I'm Dave Bittler. I'm the pastor here. It's great to have you with us this morning. If you're visiting with us, uh, we wish you a warm welcome. Uh, just a couple of announcements before we get underway this morning. Again, I'd like to remind you about our Lenten services happening on Wednesday evenings. Um, we had our first one uh, last Wednesday, looking at uh, a hymn uh, written by uh, a man named uh, Frederick Faber uh, called, O Come and Mourn With Me A While. We talked about the blessing that God gives to us in the ability to mourn over our sin, over the condition of the world, and how the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ overcomes gives us victory in the midst of that morning. This coming Wednesday, uh, we're going to be looking at a hymn by uh, a hymn writer that I'm sure you all know, um, a man named John Newton. If you're not familiar with that name, if I told you that he wrote Amazing Grace, uh, it would probably ring a few bells with you. Uh, that's not the hymn we're going to be looking at. We're going to be looking at another one of his hymns uh, that is much lesser known, but it has been very, very helpful uh, to me in my Christian walk. So I hope that you will join us Wednesday evening at 7 o'clock uh, for that um, time of study. Are there other announcements that we need to make? Could we be able to do this? Um. The annual reports have been prepared, and there's a few of them in our text. You're welcome to take one along. We're going to have the annual meeting next Sunday. But if you do take one with you today, please remember to bring it along back with you next Sunday. <laughs> the, uh, our annual report uh, meeting will be uh, next Sunday in the worship hour. Um, there are a few copies in the narthex. Um, if you take one, uh, please bring it with you next Sunday. Uh, there is, they are uh, rather thick. We'd like to save as much paper and toner uh, as we can on that. Um, but those are uh, ready and prepared for you. Uh, big thanks to Nikki, who um, works very hard on uh, getting those uh, together and ready for us. But that uh, uh, report meeting will be next Sunday. Other announcements? With that, let's take a few moments and prepare our hearts for worship as we hear the prayer.
us to worship. Hear these words from Psalm 25. To you, O Lord, I lift up my soul. O my God, in you I trust. Let me not be put to shame. Let not my enemies exult over me. Indeed, none who wait for you shall be put to shame. They shall be ashamed who are wantonly treacherous. Make me to know your ways, O Lord. Teach me your paths. Lead me in your truth and teach me, for you are the God of my salvation, for you I wait all the day long. Remember your mercy, O Lord, and your steadfast love, for they have been from of old. Remember not the sins of my youth or my transgressions. According to your steadfast love, remember me for the sake of your goodness, O Lord. Good and upright is the Lord. Therefore, he instructs sinners in the way. He leads the humble in what is right and teaches the humble his way. All the paths of the Lord are steadfast, love and faithfulness for those who keep his covenant and his testimonies. Amen. This morning in our sermon time, we're going to be looking at the story of Noah. And I was talking with Elmer this week, and we were trying to come up with um, something that would kind of uh, go along with the story of Noah. And it's, there's not a lot of music that uh, goes with the story of Noah and the Flood, other than, you know, probably, you know, who have kids or remember from when you were young, you sang the Arky Arky uh, song, which is uh, nice, but I think it was really appropriate for this. And Elmer said, I think I've got some. And uh, going back into the St. John Hill Church archives, uh, we found something uh, that was rather appropriate. So I hope you enjoy this uh, trip down memory lane for some of you. No found grace in the eyes of the Lord. No found grace in the eyes of the Lord. No found grace in the eyes of the Lord. And he landed high and dry. down from his window in the skies. I created man, but I don't remember why. Almost nothing but fighting since creation day. So I'm going to send a flood and wash them all away. So the Lord came down, looked around the spell, saw Mr. Noah doing mighty well. That is the reason the scriptures record that Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. And he landed high and dry. said, no, I'm going to send a flood. I'm going to send some water. I'm going to send some mud. So take off your hat, Noah. Take off your coat. Get Ham, Shem, Jephthah, and build yourself a boat. Well, Noah said, Lord, I don't think I could. The Lord said, Noah, get some sturdy gopher wood. You never know what you can do till you try. Build it 50 cubits high, 30 cubits wide. Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord, and he landed high and dry. Then Noah said, There she is, there she is, Lord. And the Lord said, No, it's time to get aboard. Now get yourself some creatures, a he and a she, and of course Mrs. Noah and the whole family. Noah said, Lord, it's getting mighty dark. The Lord said, Noah, get those creatures in the ark. Noah said, Lord, it's starting to pour. The Lord said, Noah, hurry up and shut the door. Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord, and he landed high and dry. Now that ark rose up on the foot of the deep, and after 40 days and nights, Noah took a peek. He said, Lord, we're not moving. Hey, where are we at? The Lord said, We're sitting on Mount Ararat. Noah said, Look, it's getting mighty dry. The Lord said, Noah, see my rainbow in the sky. Now take all your people and creatures unto the earth, and don't be more trouble than you're really worth. 
No find grace in the eyes of the Lord. No find grace in the eyes of the Lord. No find grace in the eyes of the Lord. And he landed high and dry. Some good things will just never die. <laughs> That one's going to be around for a while, I'm sure. So. The Lord calls his people to confession, to repent of their sins before him, and turn to righteousness. Would you join me in the prayer of confession that's found in your bulletin? It will be on the screen behind me. And then following that, we'll take some time for silent prayer. And then I'll close us with an assurance of pardon. Let's pray together the prayer that. It's not in your bulletin, it's on the screen. Most merciful God, whose Son, Jesus Christ, was tempted in every way, yet without sin, we confess before you that we have sinned. We have hungered after that which does not satisfy. We have compromised with evil. We have doubted your power to protect us. Forgive us our lack of faith have mercy on our weakness. Restore in us such love and trust that we may walk in your ways and delight in doing your will. Let's take a few moments and confess our own sins to God this morning. Gracious Lord, you know our secret thoughts, words, and deeds. They are all laid bare before you. Father, we come before, this, before you this morning in contrition and humility, seeking your grace and forgiveness. For not living according to your ways, not following your law, not loving you for not loving our neighbors as ourselves. Forgive us, O Lord, by the blood of Jesus, we pray. Amen. The prophet Joel reminds us, yet even now declares the Lord, Return to me with all your heart, with fasting, with weeping, and with mourning. And rend your hearts and not your garments. Return to the Lord, for he is gracious and merciful, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love, and he relents over disaster. God is gracious and will forgive when we turn to him sincerity and true repentance. Amen. Through verse 22, the end of the chapter. 
Let's hear the word of God this morning. These are the generations of Noah. Noah was a righteous man, blameless in his generation. Noah walked with God. And Noah had three sons, Shem, Ham, and Japheth. Now the earth was corrupt in God's sight, and the earth was filled with violence. And God saw the earth, and behold, it was corrupt, for all flesh had corrupted their way on the earth. And God said to Noah, I have determined to make an end of all flesh, for the earth is filled with violence through them. Behold, I will destroy them with the earth. Make yourself an ark of gopher wood. Make rooms in the ark and cover it inside and out with pitch. This is how you are to make it. The length of the ark, 300 cubits. Its breadth, 300 cubits. And its height, 30 cubits. Make a roof for the ark and finish it to a cubit above and set the door of the ark in its side. Make it with lower, second, and third decks. For behold, I will bring a flood of waters upon the earth to destroy all flesh, in which is the breath of life under heaven. Everything that is on the earth shall die. But I will establish my covenant with you, and you shall come into the ark, you, your sons, your wife, and your sons' wives with you. And of every living thing of all flesh, you shall bring two of every sort into the ark to keep them alive with you. They shall be male and female, of the birds according to their kinds, and of the animals according to their kinds, and of every creeping thing on the ground according to its kind. Two of every sort shall come in to you to keep them alive. Also take with you every sort of food that is eaten, and store it up. It shall serve as food for you and for them. Noah did this. He did all that God commanded. May God add his blessing to the reading of his word. Let's pray. Holy God, Lord Jesus Christ, Holy Spirit, We come before your word with thankful hearts for all that you show us by it. Father, would you give us your spirit this morning to be our guide and our teacher, to show us your truth. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Again, if you miss a week in this series, please go to our YouTube channel and make sure you catch up on what you miss. It'll help things kind of fit together. Because the Bible is one story. It's the same story that's being told in Genesis 1 is being told at the end of Revelation. And I'm trying to uh, help you see how the thread of this story fits together. Because we see in Genesis 3 when evil comes into the world, and it's important to note that evil does come into the world from outside. It's an intruder. It doesn't belong here. It's like a virus. It comes into your body from the outside and it wreaks Havoc. It doesn't belong there. And your body has to fight to get rid of it. Left unchecked, a virus, a parasite, bacteria coming into your body can do enormous damage. Sin and evil coming into the world, it's the same way we see with the first children, with Cain and Abel. The evil that came into the world because of their parents' disobedience begins to spiral out of control. Cain begins to look inward and he, he 
takes the life of his brother. And then the Bible tells us that in subsequent generations that that evil begins to, to, to dwell and to fester and it gets worse until the seventh generation of Lamech, he, the evil is out of control. But God's promise that an offspring of the woman would come to defeat the offspring of the serpent, while always in jeopardy, is always secure. Because he has another son named Seth. And through the line of Seth, comes this one called Noah. If we back up uh, into uh, Genesis chapter 5 and we see Adam's descendants to Noah, uh, we see in verse 28 there's another Lamech that comes through the descendants of Seth. It's not the same Lamech that came through the uh, descendant of Cain. Um, but it says when, when Lamech lived 182 years, he fathered his son and called his name Noah saying, out of the ground that the Lord has cursed, this one shall bring us relief from our work and from the painful toil of our hands. Even at his birth, it was seen that Noah would do something special in the eyes of the Lord. And we see that when we, when we first meet Noah, that the, the, the evil in the world has gone berserk. Everything in the earth was corrupt in God's sight. It was filled with violence. Notice the connection. Evil breeds violence. Righteousness brings peace. The earth was corrupt. It was filled with violence. The same Violence that overtook Cain to kill his brother Abel has now spiraled out of control. And God saw the earth. Okay? Now you remember that the, the Israelites, when they had just come out of Egypt, okay, led by Moses, heading toward the promised land, hearing these stories for the first time, they didn't have Bibles to carry around with them. They were hearing these things audibly. And so we listen for cues, and when we hear something that says, and God saw the earth, it brings our memory back to Genesis chapter 1, when God's creating the earth. And said, and God saw all that he had made, and it was good. God looks upon the earth, and it was, it was good. And now we're, we're only in Gen that was Genesis chapter 1, now we're in Genesis chapter 6. And God saw the earth, and behold, it was corrupt. For all flesh had been corrupted, for all flesh had corrupted their way on the earth. What is God to do? The beautiful world that he had made, the good world that he had made, in a short time has experienced so much corruption that he decides to make an end. But not just an end in and of itself. He promises a new beginning. So he selects another Adam this time Noah, to start again. And Noah, being a righteous man, Noah was not perfect, but he lived a life of integrity. Noah was a righteous man, blameless in his generation. He was living according to the sons of Seth, who called upon the name of the Lord, who worshipped God, sought to live out the proper covenant with creation, and with his neighbor that God had called them to. God tells him, I'm going to bring an end to the world. I want you to make for yourself an ark of gopher wood. 
And you know the story. You know how it goes. Noah and his sons quickly, God said in seven days it's going to rain. So don't dilly that. Sometimes we get this idea that Noah took a long time to build. Now God gave him a pretty short deadline. Let's get this done. Because I'm not waiting. Noah and his sons put together an ark. And God makes provision. That he's not starting over completely new, but he's going to start over where Noah becomes the new Adam, the new source of the promise. Chapter 7, it says, And the Lord said to Noah, Go into the ark, you and all your household, for I have seen that you are righteous before me in this generation. Now this is important, I bring this up, because this question comes up to me every so often. Uh, occasionally I'll get uh, folks who will ask me, they say they know that at the end of the the flood, when Noah comes out of the ark, the first thing he does is he offers sacrifice to the Lord. And I'll often get the question, well then, which animal did Noah choose to go extinct? And I said, well, let's hold off on that, because if we read chapter 7, it answers that question for us. Verse 2 says, take with you seven pairs of all clean animals. Male and female. So Noah would not sacrifice an unclean animal. So we get the idea, we always have, everybody knows the two-by-two two thing, which is true, but it wasn't just one pair of each. Of the clean animals, Noah took seven pair. So that in the sacrifice, he didn't cause any animal uh, extinction. So if you were thinking that maybe that's what happened to the unicorns, uh, that's not... Uh, what the Bible teaches us. God makes provision even for the worship that is coming. And the rains come, the flood waters rise, and the, the Bible tells us that the waters came from above and came from below. The waters from under the earth burst forth and it covered the entire face of the earth. It's interesting that, that science um, has kind of caught up to this. Science has discovered that indeed there is enough water beneath the surface of the earth to completely cover it. They thought this was a grand uh, finding. I guess like, well, the Bible told us back in Genesis chapter 7 that that could happen. Uh, that's nothing new. But everything is covered except for those who are in the ark. They are rescued from God's wrath. God's wrath is poured out on all creation. It rains for 40 days and 40 nights. The waters cover the earth for 150 days. Days. The waters begin to recede, and even that takes some time. But eventually the ark comes to rest. And Noah and his sons leave the ark. Every beast, every creeping thing, every bird, everything that moves on the earth went out by families from the ark. And then notice what happens at the end of chapter 8, verse 20. It says, Then Noah built an altar to the Lord and took some of every clean animal and some of every clean bird and offered burnt offerings on the altar. And when the Lord smelled the pleasing aroma, the Lord said in his heart, I will never again curse the ground because of man. For the intention of man's heart is evil from its youth. The problem has not been eradicated. It's still there. Even though Noah is righteous, he looks to God. He's still not the one who can defeat 
the offspring of the serpent. But again, God promises, neither will I ever again strike down every living creature as I have done. While the earth remains, seed time and harvest, cold and heat, summer and winter, day and night shall not cease. Sometimes we like to focus on the fact that God saved Noah and his family. But let us not lose sight of the fact that God also saved his creation. God still cares for the creatures that he made, for the plants that he made. And he says, while the earth remains, seed time and harvest, cold and heat, summer and winter, day and night will not cease. And then chapter 9, and God blessed Noah and his sons and said to them, be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth. That sounds familiar, right? Because again, that goes back to Genesis 1 and 2. The same command that he gives to Adam and Eve to fill the earth and subdue it, to take my image into all the earth. The fear of you and the dread of you shall be upon every beast of the earth and upon every bird of the heavens. Everything that creeps on the ground and all fish of the sea into your hand they are delivered. Every moving thing that lives shall be food for you. Before, in the garden, God had only given the fruit of the trees to be their food. Now, he says, every moving thing that lives shall be food for you. As I gave you the green plants, I give you everything. But you shall not eat flesh with its life, that is, its blood. We mentioned this before when we talked about Cain and Abel, how egregious it was in the sight of God for Cain to kill his brother. And God says to Cain, the blood of your brother cries out from the ground. For God, the shedding of blood is a very very important matter. God says, I will give you animals to eat, but let the blood drain. Let the life drain from it first. And for your lifeblood, I will require a reckoning. For every beast of the field, I will require it in from man. Now what that means is, okay, if an animal kills a person, that's just as bad. We read in the law later on that if an ox gores a person and that person dies, the ox must die. God requires a reckoning. The taking of life is very serious. It's not ever for God a trivial matter. From his fellow man, I will require a reckoning for the life of man. And then in verse 6 it says, Whoever sheds the blood of man, by man shall his blood be shed. For God made man in his own image. Now let's be very, very clear. All of humanity, all of humanity is made in the image of God. In our history, in our country and in the world, we have seen points in history where certain parts of humanity were considered to be less than human. Where certain parts of humanity, it was considered, yeah, if they die, it's okay. It's happened in a number of places. And God says it is never 
okay. It is never a trivial matter. God cares about all life. He could have wiped it all out himself. And he would have been just to do it. He would have been right to do it. But he makes a way through an ark by which humanity can enter and be saved. For Noah and his family, that ark was made out of wood. For us, Our ark was nailed to a piece of wood. Jesus becomes our ark. He becomes the vessel by which, if we are in him, we escape God's wrath. Much like it was poured out on Jesus on the cross. Jesus took that wrath so that those who would enter into him, be united with him, could be saved from God's wrath. For Noah and his family, he's told, be fruitful and multiply, increase greatly on the earth, multiply in it. You are the new Adam. No. My promise for the Savior to come is going to come through you. Then God said to Noah and his sons with him, Behold, I establish my covenant with you and your offspring after you, and with every living creature that is with you, the birds, the livestock, and every beast of the earth with you, as many as came out of the ark, for it is, it is for every beast of the earth. So God makes a covenant with all of creation. It says, I have established my covenant with you that I never again, never again shall all flesh be cut off by the waters of the flood, and never again shall there be a flood to destroy the earth. God said, I'm, I'm not going to do this again. I'm not going to start over again like this. But I am going to start over again in a different way. But he establishes his covenant. He said, this is the sign of the covenant that I make between me and you and every living creature that is with you for all future generations. I have set my bow in the clouds, and it shall be a sign of the covenant between me and the earth. In the original language, the word for bow, as we think of a rainbow, is also the same word that is used for a battle bow that is used to shoot an arrow. And some commentators would think that in God saying, I have set my bow in the clouds, he has set his bow down, he has put his weapon of war to the waters of the flood in the clouds. And you notice which way the bow is facing? Just set it down. And God has said, this is my covenant with you. When I see this sign of the covenant, I will remember that I will not destroy the earth with a flood again. It's as if God is saying, may, may my wrath come back on me if I don't keep my word. God's promises are sure. God said, no, this is the sign of the covenant that I have established between me, you, and all flesh that is on the earth. So it's not just a covenant with Noah, it is a covenant for all of creation.
And I make this point very clear that to understand God's concept of covenant is very crucial for understanding how the rest of the Old Testament plays out. We saw that God established a covenant with Adam in the garden, although he didn't use that word, that language is there. Is that is how God relates to his people through the idea of covenant. We think of covenants as being, you know, something like a marriage covenant where you have two equal parties joining together for mutual benefit. But when God makes a covenant with us, it's not two equal parties coming together. It is a superior party coming to a lesser party for mutual benefit. Notice that there's nothing, no responsibility for the man or for creation in this covenant. God makes the covenant himself. He puts his own stamp on it, his own promise on it. Later, we'll see that stipulations come for the covenants that God makes with his people. But we must always understand that we are in covenant relationship with God. And Jesus being our ark, Jesus being the Savior of God's wrath for us, when he comes and, and sits around the table with his disciples before he is to be crucified. He said, this is my body which is broken for you, and this is the cup of the new covenant in my blood. Jesus is saying, for all of you, for all of humanity, this is the new agreement by which we will live. says, by my blood, I will be your ark. I will be your salvation. That the wrath of God might not wipe you out. Come and find yourself. Take refuge in me. For Noah, the ark was a type of salvation from God's wrath. It prefigures what Jesus does for us. God, through the history of the Old Testament, continually shows the people what to look for. In the one that he promises to send, the seed of the woman who will crush the head of the serpent. He shows them, your salvation will look like this. Our relationship will look like this. Noah shows us a prefiguring, an early glimpse of what God's salvation is like. And that if we are found to take refuge in the ark of Jesus Christ, When the waters stop raging, we won't find ourselves on the top of a mountain. We will find ourselves in a beautiful city with a glorious throne, gates of pearls, streets of gold so wondrous it looks like glass. We will be in God's presence if we are found, if we find ourselves taking refuge in Him. It shows us the depths of God's mercy. 
We don't acquire this because we deserve it, because somehow we've earned it. We accept it as a free offer that God says, I want to be with you. And I want you to be with me. That's really the essence of what God's covenants are always about. I want to be your God. I want you to be my people. I want us to have wonderful fellowship together. I want to show you how to live in ways that is best for you and that honors me, your creator. So our choice is simple. We can seek refuge on the ark, or we can try to swim through it. We can try to keep our head above water in our own way. The seed of the serpent will not enter the ark. The seed of the serpent is going to rage and rage. It's going to do everything it can to keep its head above water, but it will not be ready. Nothing will. God has promised that his judgment and his wrath will one day be poured out on the earth. But he's also provided a way of salvation, a way of escape. He's provided an ark that if we are found in him, if we take shelter in him, God's mercy covers us, surrounds us, envelops us, so that we don't have to endure his wrath. And then when his wrath is over and the world is again as it should be, he brings us again into a glorious earth, a glorious city, where we will be together with him forever. Brothers and sisters, let us find our refuge. Let us take refuge in the ark that God has provided and not seek to stir up his wrath, but to accept the salvation which he freely offers. Amen. In response to God's word, let us affirm our faith together by reciting the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only begotten Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Ghost, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended into Hades. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth on the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Ghost, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. With that, let's take these requests and go before the Lord this morning, along with any unspoken requests that you may still have on your hearts. Our gracious God, we thank you for the salvation that you offer us through Jesus Christ. Father, we thank you that we can take refuge in him, that you have made a way that by his blood, by his sacrifice, we can find forgiveness and salvation 
that we can trust in him. That we do not need to face your wrath against sin and evil in the world. But Father, we know that we will be brought through. And we look forward to the new heavens and the new earth that you will bring to pass, that we will share in communion together forever with you. Father, while we wait on those days, we bring before you the concerns and cares of our hearts. Father, you've heard those that were mentioned this morning. And Lord, we lift those up before your throne, placing them at your feet, believing in your goodness and your providential care, knowing that you love us and care for us. Father, this morning, would you hear our prayers? Father, would you meet those needs? And Father, where we can be instruments of your peace in this world, would you help us and show us and guide us by your spirit how we can care for the least of these? That your name would be glorified in all things and people would see your grace and mercy through Jesus Christ. We ask all of these things in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior, who taught his disciples and so us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Would you stand with me for our closing hymn, There's a Wideness in God's Mercy. This may be, uh, the words may be unfamiliar to you, but uh, the tune uh, is one that you should uh, recognize.
Yeah. <laughs> 